thank you, Clark, and thank you all for coming along. Um, delighted to be here um, and delighted to look. I'm really looking forward to spending this quarter uh, at UCLA. Plenty of people with um, overlapping research interests. Uh, as Clark says, I'm going to talk today um, about the evolution of human communication and language. It's what, what I've spent most of my career to date researching. Um, and there's the book. Clark was meant to hold it up. I didn't tell him, but <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but before I talk about language, uh, it's given that I'm here for a quarter and I would like to talk to lots of people and widen my intellectual uh, world while I'm here. Um, just wanted to briefly mention a couple of other things I am generally interested in. Um, I uh, have a paper shortly to come out on recursive mind reading. So the idea, I can't, it's not this guy's thinking, she's thinking about what he's thinking, he can think about what she's thinking about what he's thinking, and so on and so forth. Something that, although simple mind reading is much studied, recursive mind reading is not much studied, um, but it seems to me vital for a lot of um, critical human institutions uh, and behaviours, uh, and something I've become very interested in lately. <clears throat> and I've also become very interested in cultural attraction, which is an approach to thinking about uh, culture and cultural evolution, um, developed first by Dan Sperber and then by others such as Pascal Boyer, Lawrence Hirschfeld, and so on. Um, yeah, so these are just two things that I'm interested in in general at the moment. I'm going to be collaborating with Jacob, who's just there, on, on, uh, on cultural attraction while I'm here. Uh, but yeah, as, as, I said, as uh, Clark said, today I'm going to talk about the origins and evolution of human communication and language. So the origins of human language is something with a long intellectual history. So it goes back pre-Darwin, pre -Darwin. so several uh, intellectuals have written about it. Jean-Jacques Jean Rousseau is the most well-known of the pre-Darwinian intellectuals to do so. Darwin himself wrote about the origins of language for several pages in Descent of Man. And there's been interest in it throughout the 20th century. Um, I guess the clearest manifestation of that is the many ape language experiments that took place um, from, I guess, from the 1920s onwards. <clears throat> and then uh, 1960, a famous paper by a linguist called Charles Hockett, um, where he outlined what he called the design features of language. So features of languages, the languages have which, in Charles Hockett's views, made languages what they are, made them languages. Uh, and he wrote about comparing them with other communication systems in the natural world. For instance, um, the bee dance, uh, echolocation, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and then since around the sort of last 20, 25 years or so, um, these various different uh, streams of interest from linguistics, from biology, from primatology, and so on, uh, have come together a bit more. And there's now a healthy community of people studying language origins and evolution under the name EvoLang. Conferences have been running since 1996. <clears throat> and the field, I guess, is uh, mature enough that there's now an Oxford Handbook of Language Evolution. This is a big book, it's 800 pages long. This was published in 2011. And on its back cover, it sort of says what its objectives are, and I actually agree that it does do what it says on the tin. Uh, this is a book where leading scholars present critical accounts of every aspect of the field, a wide-ranging summation of the work in all the disciplines involved. So this is a, purports to be, and I agree, an accurate portrayal of where we are in the field of language evolution. You look in the index and you look up the number of entries uh, listed under different um, subdisciplines of linguistics, and this is what you find. So syntax and related terms, semantics and related terms, plenty of entries almost nothing on pragmatics. So pragmatics is kind of the messy part of language. It's the bit that deals with language, uh, language use in context. So if you think of semantics as meaning in isolation, pragmatics is meaning in context. So what we mean is not always, what we say is not always the same as what we mean, and pragmatics deals with that difference. It's the stuff that deals with metaphor and irony uh, and various uh, ambiguity and various other topics. But yet we're barely thinking about it in language evolution. Instead, what we're doing is thinking of languages as um, more like digital codes uh, and studying them on those terms. So I'm just going to give one example. It's just a quote from a very famous paper um, uh, from Pinker and Bloom in 1990. And they talk about the vocal auditory channel having desirable features as a medium of communication, a high bandwidth a serial interface, basic tools of a coding scheme, 
uh, an inventory of distinguishable singles and a concatenation. So we've got the language of information theory of coding and decoding scattered throughout this. And this is not just how people are thinking about it, it's also, you can see this in the, the methods that people employ in the computational models and mathematical models that are built. But what people are looking at very much is coding systems and uh, how you start to combine symbols together to form more complex signals and so on and so forth. Very little work actually on the messy reality of language use out there in the world. If there's a central message to my book, it's that this agenda is a profound mistake. And I guess what I try to do in the book is to illustrate that it's a profound mistake by taking pragmatic seriously, putting it front and center. This is what we're doing with language. This is what we're doing in communication in general and showing that you can actually answer all of the big questions you might want to ask about language evolution by taking pragmatics seriously. So why do only humans have language? Where are the points of continuity and discontinuity with other species? How do languages evolve the various structural properties that make them languages? All these questions get good answers if you start to take pragmatics seriously. Now, I can't go into all of that in one talk. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, one of those questions, which is the relationship between prime, uh, non-human primate communication and human communication, uh, the similarities and differences between them, and that will actually lead us to an explanation of, or part of an explanation of why only humans have language. So let's get into a bit more detail. Actually, this is probably a good point for me to stress that um, I'm quite actually quite happy to take questions as we go along. Um, I've come from research groups where that's the norm, and I find this quite a nice way to for the speaker to know where the audience are. So please stick your hands up uh, if you have any questions. OK, so let's go into a bit more detail on what code model communication is. So one way of thinking about it is with what's called a conduit metaphor. So you have this uh, package, this thing that you put into a package, and then you send it along a conduit where it gets unwrapped at the other end. This is a way of thinking about how communication works in the first place. And we see this metaphor. Uh, in our everyday language, send me your ideas, get your message across. Expressions like this are all employing this conduit metaphor. Another way of thinking about communication, very famous way, is Shannon and Weaver's information theory. So the idea here is that there's information which gets encoded by some encoding algorithm and it gets transmitted, maybe some noise enters the situation here. And then at this end it gets decoded by some uh, decoding algorithm and if the encoding algorithm and the decoding algorithm are appropriately calibrated to one another, then what, goes in at one, what comes out at one end is the same as what went in at the other end, and we can say communication has been successful. And <clears throat> so there's actually there's a plus sign here, although it's not strictly a sort of a, an equation. If you add these two up, you get this. But you can probably see how, if, you start, if you're thinking about communication in these terms, you end up with what I'm calling natural code. So you have, and these are essentially pairs of associations. So you have an association between a state of the world and a signal, and then an association between a signal and a response. And if those associations are mat matched up to one another, you can say we've got some sort of communication system. So this is one natural code, this could be another natural code. And natural codes are a perfectly good way to think about many instances of communication in the natural world. It's how computers communicate, but it's also um, I think the best way to describe all sorts of uh, natural communication systems from bacteria through insects, animals, and so on and so forth. The problem is, oh, right, okay, oh, so, okay, before I move on to the problem, um, this is kind of stressing the point I was making earlier that in language evolution, we're very much at the moment thinking about communication in terms of natural code. So a BBS paper, 2009, uh, Nicholas Evans and Steve Levinson. Those interested in the evolution and biological preconditions for language have been looking in the wrong place. So I agree with them. Instead of looking at the pragmatics of communicative exchange, they've been focused on the syntax and the combinatorics. So that's where we are at the moment. We're looking at these codes and the combining together of these codes in various ways. So this is Wittgenstein on the left and Paul Grice, who's often seen as the founder of uh, pragmatics as a discipline. I like, this, uh, I like this slide because of the way they seem to be quizzically looking at each other, uh, which kind of underlines one of the points they would, both of them wanted to make, or at least that Wittgenstein at one point of his career wanted to make, which is that <coughs> communication is not as simple as this. So actually, if, 
you know, it's very tempting, it's very attractive to look at languages and to try to make them fit this box of natural codes and to cut them up into digital components and so on and so forth. Um, but that doesn't work, it turns out. And the realities of underdeterminacy, the fact that what I say is not the same as what I mean, um, <clears throat> is actually, it's not just sort of a messy thing on the edges, it, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. It's kind of, a, this is the point that both, these, both of these philosophers wanted to make, and we can see it. I mean, I'm not gonna go deep into the philosophy, but we can see several simple examples just here. So the most trivial example is to say, well, what's the that here? Okay, so we have these deictic expressions in languages. Pronouns, um, he, she, and so on, another example. This here, is this bank? Is this the side of the river, or is it a financial institution? Right? We don't know. This could mean dinner, could mean run away, it could mean look at the cute fluffy bunny, could mean all sorts of things. And then this one here, <clears throat> Peter's, uh, Peter's answer here doesn't, act, uh, for those that can't see, Mary says, would you like to join us for dinner? And Peter replies, I ate earlier. And Peter's response doesn't actually answer Mary's question directly. Right? He has not answered the question yet. We all know and Mary knows what he's, what he's getting at. Right? Now, the point I'm making here is not the trivial and obvious one that there is ambiguity in language. We all know that. Nobody's going to deny that. The point is that as a code, as, a, as something to make communication possible in the first place, languages are not very good. In fact, they're quite hopeless. If all you've got is the code, if that's all, you don't know what this means. You don't know what this means, and you don't know what any of this means on its own. So the natural, if we go back to think about the natural codes, they made communication possible in that information theoretic way. Communication can be said to exist if you have those pairs of association. That's simply not true here. If you just have the code, uh, the linguistic code, you don't have communication, not yet. So taking these facts seriously, pragmatics has developed a different way of thinking about communication. Well, I say A, there's probably several different proposals out there. I think the clearest one, it comes from Dan Sperber and Deirdre Wilson's relevance theory. And the label they use to contrast their way of thinking about communication with the code model. So they coined the term code model and they contrast it with what they call ostensive, the ostensive inferential model. Slightly cumbersome phrase, but it does capture what they're trying to describe. And the idea is that we're providing evidence. <coughs> and uh, as <coughs> when we talk, we're providing evidence. And what we're providing evidence for is intentions. And more precisely, those intentions are what we call a communicative intention and informative intention. So, an informative intention is my intention that you come to believe something. So if I say there is cake for dinner, I want you to believe that there is cake for dinner. Okay, that's my intention. I want to change your mental states so that you, so that such that you now think that there's going to be cake for dinner. A communicative intention is my intention that you recognise that I have a an informative intention in the first place. So I intend that you understand that I intend that you understand that there is cake for dinner. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that sounds complex, um, but it does very, from a, I mean, I'm certainly not going to go into all the details because we'd be here all week, but uh, when, you get very much, when you get into the details of relevance theory, this account of this way of thinking about communication starts to deal with the, um, starts to deal seriously with the philosophical issues that Grice and Wittgenstein and plenty of others Start, uh, we're addressing, or we're raising, excuse me. A more simple way, rather than getting into all the jargon, the way, kind of the simple way of thinking about what's going on here, is we're expressing two intentions. One is what I'm trying to communicate, and the other is the fact that I'm trying to communicate. Okay? So what am I trying to say, and am I trying to say anything at all? So this is not just an account of linguistic communication, but communication in general. So how, what's the difference between sort of this point, which is direct and very clearly directing towards Clark, and this point here, where I'm looking at my watch and the fact that I'm pointing is incidental. Okay, one of these is communicative and the other one is not. So one of them is expressing a communicative intention and the other is not. Okay, so that's, that's the need for the communicative intention there. And then once you recognize that somebody has a communicative intention, you can go about the challenge of identifying the content of the informative intention of this half here. 
And as I say, this is not just linguistic. We see this all the time. So pointing is one example, but we also shrug. We do all sorts of things with our bodies. And when we do, we do them in stylized and exaggerated ways and in doing so make it apparent to our intended audience that we're trying to communicate with them and what it is we're trying to communicate. So here's one example. I was in a pub some weeks ago, standing at the bar with a friend. And we're both uh, facing that way, the bars here. Um, <clears throat> and I had my note in one hand and my other hand just here. And my friend had just ordered some chips and they'd arrived on the, uh, just, they'd just been given to him. So they're situated just here. And we're chatting away. And I, with my hand, I just went like this. I don't know if you can all see that. So I, I was just chatting away like this. And then I did this in a deliberate and stylized way, made this gesture with my hand. And he just said, yes. And then I took a chip and I ate it. Okay, so <clears throat> now this, we, we move our hands around all the time, right? But there's something about the stylized and exaggerated way in which I did that, which revealed to my friend that <clears throat> I, A, I wanted to communicate with him and B, what it was I wanted to communicate. This is not something you can capture with a natural code. There's, we didn't have any convention associated with this expression and the idea, can I have a chip? This is just something that's cre created on the fly. And say, we shrug our shoulders, we do all sorts of things. This is ostensive communication. So what we have here are two ways of thinking about the very possibility of communication in the first place. On the one hand, we have the code model. And the code model is defined by the fact that it's made possible by associations. So if you have an organism able to make associations with the state of the world and with some behavior, uh, and perhaps with observations of the world and some reaction, then you can have communication in the code model type way. Okay, we see this all over the natural world. On the other hand, you have this other type of communication, which is about expressing and recogni recognizing intentions. And so this is made possible. What defines it as a type of communication is the fact that it's a, it's a type of meta-psychology. It's a type of uh, man manipulating others' minds and mind reading Mind reading and manipulation. So I, as a speaker, I'm trying to change your mental states right now. I'm manipulating your minds, and you're trying to read my mental states. I have intentions, and you're trying to read them. Made possible by mechanisms of metapsychology. And the difference here, I want to stress that the difference here is not one of degree. It's one of kind. And the way to make that graphic is to contrast it with an entirely different domain, namely locomotion. So flying and walking are two different types of locomotion. But we don't want to say that flying is sort of some sort of enhanced form of walking. Okay? They're the same sort of thing, they're locomotion, but they're totally different ways of going about it, difference in kind. Similarly, ostensive communication and code model communication are differences in kind. Okay. So where does language fit into this distinction? So it's a very easy assumption to make, a common assumption, that with linguistic communication, what we're dealing with is a system which is really at the bottom, it's a code. And then on top of it, you plug in all this meta-psychology, this pragmatics, uh, and then you get language. Um, <clears throat> many people, both linguists, both those inside linguistics and those outside, have said that Sometimes linguists have physics envy. So they, they look at physics with its world where they can cut things up into precise things that are clearly identifiable. And they're trying to do the same thing with language. So you've got these individual phonemes and they're distinct from each other and phonetic and you can do the same thing for syntax and it goes to semantics and so on and so forth. And so the, the object of study for linguistics becomes the, uh, well, in addition, the object of study for linguistics are the languages themselves, the, the linguistic code, and so it's very easy to think that this is really what linguistic communication is about, is a type of communication made possible by associations, i.e. a code model. And then the meta-psychology, the pragmatics, is the bonus. That's what makes it more expressively powerful. The reality is exactly the other way around. This, is, uh, this common assumption is upside down. What's going on here in linguistic communication is that our communication is made possible by ostension, inference, meta-psychology, and then on top of that, what we've done is created a linguistic code which allows us to be much more expressive and more precise than we otherwise could be. So I can point to things in this room, but with language I can point to things remote in time and space. And I do that because I've got these tools, what we call the linguistic code, the conventions, that allow me to do that. It's vital that our terminology reflects this, uh, the difference between the linguistic, between 
the sorts of codes that are making ostensive communication more powerful, and the natural codes we had earlier. So natural codes make communication possible. That's the point I was making earlier. The linguistic code, on the other hand, is a different type of code. It's a type of code that makes a different type of communication, ostensive communication, more powerful. So I use this label conventional codes. The linguistic code is a conventional code. It makes another type of communication, ostensive communication, more powerful than it otherwise would be. <clears throat> okay, and so now we understand what it is, what language is. Lang languages are conventional codes designed to make a type of communication more expressively powerful than it otherwise would be. And with that thought in mind, we can be very clear about what it is we're trying to explain the origins and the evolution of. And you can boil this down to two things. On the one hand, we need to explain how we evolve the social cognitive mechanisms that make ostensive communication possible in the first place. That's one challenge. And the other challenge is to explain the creation and the cultural evolution of the conventional code itself. How, when we're interacting with each other, do we create these codes, converge upon uh, shared meanings for those codes? And how do they change as well they are used in interaction and pass between generation to come to take the structural features that we associate with languages? They're really, to my mind, the two big questions for evolutionary linguistics. I'm going to talk in the rest of the talk about number one. So number two is where I think cultural attraction has a big role to play and it's a very exciting area for, of research, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to focus in the rest of this talk on number one. Okay, so there's a whole um, body of research looking at comparing uh, the cognitive abilities of humans and particularly human children with those of our primate relatives and particularly chimpanzees. But immediately when I look at this literature, I see a bit of, uh, at least a challenge to comparison from when we're looking at it from the pragmatic perspective. So in pragmatics, we have a rich body of theory. We've defined this thing called ostensive communication as a very central idea about how human communication works. And people looking at non-human primate communication certainly recognize the importance of pragmatics. There's no question of that. The idea that intentions are critical is um, central to that literature. But what people have been studying for the most part is not this, but something else that is called intentional communication. Now, it, so they immediately the question is, well, are these the same thing? If not, how do they differ? Okay. And I think they are different things. Uh, so here's, uh, so when people look for intentional communication in the primate literature, there's a whole bunch of different criteria that are used. Sometimes sometimes consistently, sometimes inconsistent between different studies. And sometimes that inconsistency is for good methodological reasons. It's easier to look for certain of these criteria in, um, in one domain, say the vocal domain rather than the gestural domain and so on. Um, but anyway, the literature at, by, at large tends to use some or all of these seven criteria uh, as measures of intentional communication. And some of these might be stronger uh, or weaker than others, okay? Now, rather than going to a detailed discussion of these, what I want to bring attention to is that all of these are really about goal-directedness. They're about how the signal itself is used, okay? So is the signal used in a, in a goal-directed way, in an intentional way, or is it used in a more uh, less socially sensitive way, in a way that suggests, perhaps suggests uh, less metapsychology involved? Now, thinking back to what ostensive communication is, ostensive communication is defined as the expression of intentions. So what intentions are doing here, they are the thing that is being expressed. They are what is expressed. I express my informative intentions and my communicative intentions. When I point in a stylized way rather than an incidental way, I'm expressing a communicative intention. Whereas what's been studied in the primate literature, it seems to me, is how signals are being produced. Are they being produced in an intentional way or not? So these are not quite the same thing. Having said that, you'll often see the language um, used in the literature uh, conflating the two. So this communicative intentions, had definitely this phrase has a technical definition in pragmatics. It's the thing that expresses signaling signalhood, the fact that you're trying to communicate. Um, but it's, this paper is certainly very much talking about 
an intention to communicate actually about this sort of thing. Um, I mean, it's not obvious to me that these are the same things. What we really need to look at is, is uh, do we see the expression and recognition of informative and communicative intention? So that's what ostensive communication is at bottom. And so that's really the questions we should be asking. And there's at least enough data out there for us to make a ten give us a tentative answer to this question. So that's where we're going now. OK, so the expression and the recognition of communicative intentions and informative intentions. So we've got a two by two grid, and we can ask it about, about both human children and about great apes. And first, we're going to look at the expression of informative intentions. So an informative intention is an intention to manipulate a mental state. Okay, I have an intention to change your mental states right now about what informative intentions are and so on and so forth. Right. So how might we go about testing this in the lab? So here's one way. So in this study, uh, the children come into the lab and they play a game. You can set it up in various ways, but the long and short of it is that the child is going to make a request of the adult for an object, in this case a ball. Okay, and then they're going to get the ball, but they're going to get it in one of two different conditions. Either they're going to get it because the experimenter says, oh, you want the ball, here's the ball, everybody's happy. Or the experimenter is going to say, oh, you want the paper or the elephant, and then accidentally give them the ball. So in this case, the child, has their material goal is satisfied, but if they have an informative intention, an intention to manipulate a mental state, that's actually not been satisfied because the, ad the adult's mental state has not been changed in the way that the child so wished. Whereas in this case, that has happened. And what you find is that children kick up a fuss in this situation. Okay, they start complaining. No, you didn't understand. No, I want the ball. Well, you have the ball. But, 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 but. And you can see where this goes. Okay. And the fact that they're complaining shows that their goals are not simply material, not simply to get the ball, but to change the mental state of the adult, which in turn will get them the ball. So children understand, they have some understanding of what an informative intention is and they're able to express it and understand when that intention has been satisfied or not. Nobody's done the comparable experiment with great apes. Okay. Recognition of informative intention, when they actually hear nobody's done the experiment with great apes or with children, and the sort of experiment that could be done would be uh, similar to the previous one that I just described, but perhaps with an observer. And if that observer, um, hold on, my thoughts have gone blank, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, I've had a mind blank. Uh, so, oh no, my mind's gone blank. Hopefully you're doing the work for me and you're on your own. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, maybe so, yeah. So, like, the observer Go. observes the wrong, complains, the wrong thing is given, and the observer Good. says bad, 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 or something? Good. OK, yes, right, it's coming back now. So <laughs> uh, the observer can, so, so let's say, let's go back to the previous one just for the, where are we? Here we go. Let's say we're in this situation. And then the child doesn't complain, or, or an, another adult, there's two adults, and this adult asks for the ball, gets the ball, but even though they were misunderstood. Does the observer say, hold on, something's not up, something's not right here? Okay. And if they do, they're recognising that somebody else has an inform, namely this person has an informative intention. Okay. Nobody's done that experiment with kids or with apes. So we don't know the answer to that cell. Let's look now at communicative intentions. So communicative intentions are intention to make it apparent to your audience that you have an informative intention. It's signalling signalhood, making it apparent to somebody that you want to communicate with them in the first place. Now, the recognition of communicative intentions has been studied in uh, several different ways. Um, I think the clearest demonstration is in this paper. So what happens here, this is where the example of the point, the incidental point, because I'm looking at my watch and the direct point, uh, come from. So in this study, uh, so the children and the experimenter play a game and they play with these toys and then the game comes to an end and they have to pack the toys away and uh, they do so. One of the toys is accidentally sort of left out somewhere else in the room. Uh, and the child's just about to put it away and then the experimenter points at the toy. 
Okay? And the experimenter either points at the toy in a very ostensive, deliberate, stylized way, I, with the expression of a communicative intention, so this, looking at the child, or they look at, the, they point, they're still pointing, but they're looking at their watch, okay? Uh, so superficially similar behaviors, but one expresses a communicative intention, the other one doesn't. And what happens is that the children are far more likely to put, go and fetch the toy and put it away when uh, the communicative intention has been expressed. So it seems that the children are able to recognize the communicative intention when it's expressed by an adult. Again, not been done in great apes. Right. <coughs> Can Isn't that a signal about a signal? Isn't that a signal I'd, about um, pay attention to what follows? I'd need, I don't know the literature you're referring to in enough detail, so I'd have to go into, um, I'd have to look at that we to be able to answer your question. Yeah, um, sure. Play bells and things like that, you know. And, but, but all animals in the game of so play have the, play intentional signals. Right, okay, so. These things are akin to attention getters, I guess. Is that? And then you can think about multi-component signals, where there might be a hoot before something becomes more right. informative in some way. Um, so it seems to me that uh, some. Uh, so I'm more familiar with the idea of attention getters, but w that seems similar to what you're pointing to. That seems describable to me in terms of a natural code. So you can form associations between those behaviours and. Uh, and the, and, and, and the subsequent behavior. And hence you can say, well, this could well be a natural code. Okay, what's going on here is that, so, so I mean, I th the, the study I just described would be stronger if it wasn't pointing, if it, if it was something that was, the un, 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 you know, uncontroversially couldn't be said to have, any convention to have been formed. Um, and that's, that's really the litmus test, right? Um, so, so it's that, it's the, it's the, when I was in the pub with my friend and I tilted my hand, there's, there's no, there's no, con there's, there's no pre-established convention or anything else there. Um, when you do see, I mean, so, is yeah. Is arbitrariness necessary? In the sense that um, if you take a more continuous view of the evolution of signals or the evolution of meaning or the evolution of manipulation, mm -hmm. um, arbitrariness is great. That's one of Hawkins criteria. Yeah. Yeah. But you could imagine, um, pressures, structure, form follows function, mm -hmm. function follows you know, design criteria, things sound and look certain ways to be effective, efficacy. Yeah. And uh, it's nice to sort of say humans are unique because we can have arbitrary signals, but is that a necessary component you know, of thinking about the, these intentional... No, no, I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not saying, um, I'm not trying to link arbitrariness to, to this distinction I'm trying to draw up here at the moment. What I'm saying is that the best way to test the true expression and recognition of communicative intentions is in a context where there's no way you could say this is a, a conventional code, a natural code of any sort. I'm interested in the question of how you test for these things, and the best way to do that would be in that way. Well, coming back to the attention getters, I mean, they, most of them seem to be iconic from my knowledge of them, but it's conceivable they don't have to be. But either way, they, they can be described in terms of a natural code. I agree with that. Yeah, okay. Okay, finally, the expression of communicative intention. So expressing the need, uh, expressing the fact that you want to communicate with somebody else. Now, how are you going to go about testing this in children? Well, great apes is really don't know, but in children it's not straightforward. Um, <clears throat> a few years ago, I spent some time in Mike Tom Sellers lab, and we looked at something that's not strictly speaking the expression of community intentions, but is effectively um, well. It shows that it shows exactly the same sort of thing. So we were in, we were interested in something called hidden authorship. So with hidden authorship, this is providing a stimulus for someone, but hiding the fact that you're actually providing it for them. So imagine you're at a polite dinner party and you want some more wine, um, but it's impolite for you to ask your host for more wine directly. So you wait until he or she has turned her back, turned their back, and then you move your empty wine glass to somewhere conspicuous in the middle of the table, and you wait for them to turn around, and then they see the wine glass and they fill it up. Okay. So you provided a stimulus for someone, 
but you've hidden the fact that it's for them. And this is interesting because it, it, uh, it expresses an intention or it's evidence of an intention which has the same relationship to an informative intention that a communicative intention does. It's just there's a negative. So rather than I intend that you understand that I have an informative intention, I intend that you don't understand that I have an informative intention towards you. But otherwise, it's the same sort of thing. So we wanted to test whether children could hide authorship. So uh, here's how we went about it. So the first thing I should say is we did it with uh, three and five-year-olds, quite young kids. This kid's quite a bit older, but that's because this video is from the pilot study. But it's representative of, of what, uh, what happened. So uh, there's experimental one here and the child. This is experimental two. Experimental one and the child come into the room first, and they find in the middle of the room this box which has got four holes in it, and you can see from the holes what sort of objects belong in them. So there's a hat, there's a car, and there's a ball, and so on and so forth. And, oh, I like the hiding and finding game. We need to find these objects. They're hidden around the room. Let's go and find them. So the experimenter and the child find the objects. And in that way, the child... Uh, and then they... Excuse me. They find the objects, and then the experimenter says, oh, experimenter two's coming along as well, and she really likes the hiding finding game, so we need to put these objects back where we found them so she can have a go herself. So then they go about that. So now the child knows where all the objects are. Okay. Then the child sits down just here, next to experimenter one. Experimenter com two comes in uh, and is going to play the hiding and finding game. Before I describe exactly what she does, it's worth stressing that the ball that goes in here is hidden just behind this barrier, so just next to where the child sits down. Okay. This barrier here is the same as this barrier here. Uh, and experimenter two comes in and says, oh, it's the hiding and finding game. I really like the hiding and finding game. And then she says, but, and she says one of two different things depending on condition. She says, either says, oh, I really don't like it if I can't complete it, in which case she's giving the child license to help her. Or she says, but I really don't like it if anybody helps me complete it. So now she's forbidding the child from helping her find the object. So then she goes around and she finds a couple of the objects. She's already found the hat, as you can see. And then there's a couple of others. She can't find them. Oh, where's the ball? I can't find it. I'm looking everywhere. And she spends plenty of time with her back to the child so the child can do various things to help her without her knowing. And the question is, what's the child going to do? So keep your eye on this child here and what he does with the ball. So he just moves, takes the ball, just moves it in front, and then the experimenter turns around and says, oh, there's the ball. Why didn't I see it earlier? It was always there in clear view. Right? And the child's very happy. Not, this is a seven, like I said, this is a seven-year-old child. You do it with younger kids. It's not quite as clean <laughs> as this. <laughs> they do things like, <clears throat> <laughs> and they, you know, in various ways, try to have it both ways. But the fact that they're trying to have it both ways shows that they understand the difference between an informative intention providing the stimulus for someone, and the communicative intention, the fact that you're trying to communicate with them. <coughs> and we find a um, uh, very clear difference in both three- and five-year-olds uh, in terms of the number of uh, uh, times they suppressed that intention uh, in various trials. Okay, so here's our provisional conclusions. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I missed. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask it after you do your provisional conclusion. Oh, okay. Is it? It's going to be about this slide, is it? Or? Yeah. Uh, it's about this experiment as a whole. So. Go, 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 go. go no, now. it's better. If you oh, do okay. This. All right. Well, my provisional conclusion is that children uh, know what ostens ch children are ostensive communicators. So there's one of these uh, cells we, that isn't filled in, and you were right to raise that we, the point that um, uh, for for this here we have that this could be, perhaps be done. With, uh, without points and with some other, uh, some other behavior. But it's look, starting to look like children, the answer for children here is going to be yes. The answer for great apes, we don't know, and there are clear methodological challenges to doing these sorts of studies with chimps. I mean, I see that. Nevertheless, when I've spoken to uh, relevant experts of chimpanzee communication and cognition, they express a great deal of skepticism that chimps are going to pass these sorts of studies. Okay. That, that's the entirely provisional conclusion could be overturned by data. Of course it could. Um, but my provisional conclusion, well, sorry, no, I should, I should add also. It's also interesting that the studies haven't been done. So although some of them, so the hidden authorship study, it's not at all clear how you would do that, big methodological challenges. But uh, the, the first study about uh, um, when the, the ball and receiving the right object 
for the wrong reason and so on and so forth. That is perhaps surmountable, but nobody seems to have done it. Um, and I wonder if, I do wonder if the reason why nobody's done that is because um, researchers are skeptical that chimps are going to pass it and if you get negative results, difficult to interpret, difficult to publish. Maybe little motivation for pursuing such an experiment if you're skeptical about the possible outcome. Entirely provisional. Um, totally, these conclusions could be overturned by data. But for now, it seems to me that the data suggests that non-human primates are not communicating in an ostensive inferential way. Uh, I don't know if you have maybe just maybe 30 seconds, depending upon our time. Because we do have, you actually do have time. I'm not yeah. sure how much else you want to. But the, the division you spoke of, uh, you're looking at the social aspects of the subject here, right? Of your ostensive and informative things. And you said you weren't going to look at cultural. Um, beyond a certain age, in humans, of course, mm -hmm. culture is very strong. Of course, yeah. And whether or not a teenager or an adult is going to do something that a child might do is a question. Mm -hmm. And how they're going to do it is certainly going to be a question. So my basic question is, um, what's your, your justification for separating the social from the cultural, and perhaps if you have time, since we normally end at one, could you give us a minute of what that cultural research is that you're doing okay. in this area? So I'm not trying to separate social from cultural, that's the first thing to say. So what I'm separating out is the social cognitive mechanisms, cognitive mechanisms that make commu ostensive communication possible in the first place. So they're mechanisms of metapsychology which give rise to these sorts of behaviours. But my question on is, how can you, particularly with teenagers and adults, mm -hmm. take out the culture, the strong cultural I'm, influence which is going to be there? I'm not trying to. You're not? No. So, if you have time now, I'm dragging it on, <laughs> <laughs> right, to talk a little bit about the cultural aspects of your research in, in this area, in your so I still have a few slides to go. Can I do that in the question session? Okay, so yeah. that will be my first question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've made this dichotomy earlier between two different ways of thinking about the very possibility of communication. So extension and inference on the one hand, which provisionally for now I'm going to say is only seems to be present in humans. And on the other hand, code model communication. So if it is the case that non-human primates don't communicate ostensibly, then it should be the case that they communicate using natural codes. But we should check that. Let's look at the data here. So do they communicate using natural codes? Certainly true that uh, great ape gestural communication is accepted to be intentional. And there's a live debate in the literature at the moment about the origins of these natural co uh, of, of the codes that are being used. So on the one hand, you have researchers arguing that a process of ontogenetic ritualization can give rise to these codes. Others saying that it's more of a perhaps innate or in some way species-wide repertoire. The point I want to make is that either way, what we're looking at here is, the argu is an argument about the origins of associations between states of the world and behaviours and be between behaviours and responses. In other words, the origins of natural codes. So they're not using the language of natural codes, but they are talking about associations of certain types. That's the pervasive through the discussions that are going on in this literature. Here's a quote. We conducted naturalistic observations of wild East African chimpanzees. Our results indicate that chimpanzees um, uh, are able to respond flexible. Why have I put that quote there? I have no idea. <laughs> that must be lost. Ignore that. OK. <laughs> It's kind of relevant, but I'm not entirely sure what point I was trying to make. OK. Oh, yes, this is why. OK, let me go back. Now I know why. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's go down to here. OK, so there's a natural code. But what's particularly interesting about these natural codes is that they seem to be used in a very flexible way. So it's not so we can describe, for instance, bacterial communication in terms of a natural code. And that would be a very uh, fixed natural code um, governed by various quite relatively simple 
mechanisms. Uh, so then, but it seems to be more flexible in chimpanzees, so there's a question about where that flexibility comes from. And the natural answer would be some sort of theory of mind, metapsychological abilities of some sort. Um, obviously, it's a, you know, as I'm sure many, most, all of you are aware, there's live debates about exactly what the extent of such abilities might be in chimpanzees, but there does seem to be, a, may not be a full-blown theory of mind, but some sort of uh, awareness of the goals of others some, does seem to be present in some of our primate relatives. So the answer to this question here is a kind of a yes, but. So yes, they do seem to be natural codes, but they're natural codes which are being made more expressively powerful by forms of metapsychology. This, interestingly, appears to be the very opposite of what we actually see in linguistic communication. So in linguistic communication, we've got, it's made possible by mechanisms of metapsychology, which allow us to shrug, to point, to do all these things that we do non-verbally. And then it's made more precise and expressively powerful by mechanisms of association, by the fact that we can create these conventions. Great ape communication seems to be ent entirely the other way up. So it's made possible by these natural codes, but then that's used in a particularly flexible way that makes it richer than other natural codes out there in the natural world uh, because of some forms of uh, metapsychology. So how would we tell the difference between these two different types of communication? Well, if you have a set of associations made more powerful by metapsychology, then what you should expect to see is some sort of more finite set of prototypes of some sort. That's the base of associations, but then it's used in, a, in more flexible ways. And it seems to me that the quote that, that paper was taken from and other papers seem to be pointing in that direction. Papers that are looking at uh, cataloguing what uh, non-human primate communication systems look like are converging upon this sort of conclusion. On the other hand, if you have a system made possible by metapsychology and then made more powerful by associations, then essentially anything goes. If it's made possible by metapsychology, then you can, you can create six new signals uh, at will. So you have associations that can be used in all sorts of ways, and you'll have the one-off use of novel behaviours like the twisting of my wrist um, for communicative ends. This seems to be what we see in language. So these points have important implications for how we think about continuity and discontinuity in human communication and language. So as I said earlier, it's a common assumption in evolutionary linguistics, or in linguistics in general, um, and in evolutionary linguistics. The, the code is the thing that makes everything possible, and the pragmatics goes on top as this, uh, the, the messy stuff goes on top and makes it more powerful. And you can see that. So this is Jim Herford's two uh, books, 2007, 2012. We see in uh, alarm calls a skeletal version of our own shared code. So the continuity there between the monkey calls and the human language. It seems quite plausible that early precursors of language were much more perhaps entirely coding, decoding in nature. So language starts as a code model and you add the pragmatics on later. I think this is a big mistake. We're taking the emphasis on continuity here is taking the Darwinian lesson that form changes very gradually, but then applying it to function too. It's a bit like saying, well, Flying is a very powerful form of locomotion. Walking is less powerful. Darwin tells us these things change gradually, so one must have evolved from the other. Right? That doesn't fly. The real continuity here is in social intelligence. So non-human primate communication is made more expressively powerful by forms of metapsychology. When they're made even more rich, they allow a whole new type of communication system, ostensive communication. When you start to add in the layers, the recursive mind-reading layers, then, you, then from the, the tool that was being used to make a natural code more powerful, you suddenly get a quite new form of communication, ostensive communication, which really opens the floodgates to all sorts of communicative richness. Okay, let me wrap up. Human communication is ostensive and inferential. We are expressing and recognising intentions, informative and communicative intentions. It's critical when we're thinking about the evolution of language to distinguish natural codes and conventional codes. Natural codes make communication possible in the first place. Okay, computers communicate in that way, bacteria do, and so on and so forth. Conventional codes do something quite different. They make an already existing different type of communication system more powerful than it otherwise would be. 
something I didn't talk about in detail, but what that was that point number two from earlier. If we're going to look at the cultural evolution of conventional codes, then the right framework, I think, to do that is cultural attraction. Non-human primate communication is probably using natural codes. That is a conclusion that could be overturned by more data. And, uh, but it's made more power expressive by some limited forms of metapsychological abilities. What that tells us is the continuity between non-human primates uh, and humans uh, is really in social intelligence. Uh, it goes from limited forms of mind reading and manipulation to a form of mind reading and manipulation where we're actually trying to help each other do that. I'm trying to, I'm encouraging you to read my mind right now and you're allowing me to manipulate your mental states. And more generally, pragmatics, the messy reality of using language out there in communication, in real world language use, is sorely neglected in language evolution research. Thank you very much for your time. Just in perhaps two or three minutes to give an example of your research on that question of what you call cultural attraction. I'd never heard that term before. Okay. So the idea of um, cultural attraction is that, so, so the thing to explain, right, so there are, well, okay, that's two or three minutes, that's long enough. Okay, so culture consists of two types of things, mental representations and public expressions of those mental representations. Okay. Some mental representations are widely shared in the community and some are idiosyncratic. The ones that are widely shared are ones we call cultural. So we might all have similar ideas of you know, God or whatever it might be. Okay. And if we all have similar versions of that mental representation, we call it cultural. So the thing to do, so, so the thing that he's explaining is why some, uh, some mental representations are common in the population and some are not common. And uh, the, I guess the key insight in cultural attraction theory is that as uh, these mental representations and their public expressions are passed through a community, and, cha and as, I, as I'm talking to you, I'm taking my mental representations, forming a public expression, and you're taking that public expression and forming your own mental representations. There's no guarantee that those two mental representations are the same, and in fact our mechanisms of communication and cognition are actually going to manipulate them to fit with our existing mental representations and so on and so forth. Uh, and they're going to change in, those changes are often going to be common through a population. So you might change it in a very similar way to many other people. Uh, and if, if, those, if many of us are making similar changes, then those mental representations tend to gravitate in certain directions and not in others. Yeah, well, uh, well there, are, there are important, uh, subtle but I think very important differences yeah, between, the, important. between the labels. Um, which I'm not going to go into the details, but yeah. Uh, no, I understand that. Yeah. I think I can stop from there as far okay. as I'm concerned, because I understand that. Okay. Do you know the work of Dwight Reed on kin selection? Uh, a little, yeah. You know, yeah. He's yeah. not here. Is Dwight here? Is Dwight? There he is. Hi, Dwight. Yeah. He's American. We've exchanged a couple so of emails. So you don't see him beforehand. Not that he's invisible. <laughs> so, um, taking your argument uh, for Darwinian gradualism seriously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I actually have objections to your flight okay. analogy, but I'll hold that aside. Okay. Of course, wings were four minutes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I, re I realized that. I didn't, so, yeah. um, uh, it's more to make a point than to... I, I understand, but so the, the same concern applies more substantively to um, your conclusions with regard to differences between great apes and humans. Which is, how do we get here from there? That is, um, if um, theory of mind abilities and social reasoning in general um, appear progressively across apes and presumably in, in going deeper in time across hominids, right? um, then why do we get a reversal? Why don't we see the same sort of emergence of um, communicative abilities in parallel with mind reading abilities? in, you know, co-extant apes now rather than the reverse that you claim, right? So you're claiming, you're claiming that the, um, the social cognition adds to the ability to manipulate the natural codes, um, but it isn't the driver 
of much of the behavior, and the reverse is true in humans. And I would say, well, why don't we see the two emerging? You know, if, if what we see is more limited abilities in, in both extent in X and great apes, and if we're taking them as some window into the past, the smell of the phylogenetic limitations on that, then why the reversal? Wouldn't you expect to see? But, you know, concordant with Darwinian gradualism, you would expect to see the same okay. kind of linear yeah. progression. What that is, there's no half a wing problem there. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. but, you know, there's a, a little bit of a forelimb with some feathers on it, and then there's a bit more, and then there's a bit more, and it stops being a forelimb right. and starts being a wing, and so on. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, so in a way, the the, f the 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 point where my analogy with with locomotion and wings falls down is exactly where I want to how I want to answer the question. So that analogy isn't perfect. I go on. Um, so you get into the details of ostensive communication, it's an intention that you understand that I have an intention that you understand X, okay? So you don't get ostensive communication until all that apparatus is in place. So you, you, there, there aren't, it doesn't seem to me that there are, there, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to me that there are partly ostensive forms of communication. You've got to have that whole apparatus in place in the first place. So you can build, ever more sophisticated ways of reasoning about each other's minds. But once they, and it's only once they start to become recursive in quite a rich way that you actually get ostensive communication happening. Okay, so you uh, have to have all of the selection for the mind reading abilities coming from something else. Yeah, which would be uh, some, some sort of social brain, et cetera, hypothesis, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Good, you know, it's a Machiavellian intelligence argument with no yeah. communication in there at all. No, not in the first place, yeah, yeah. Okay. Does it necessarily depend upon some idea of gradualism? What does what depend on the idea of gradualism? Does your argument really depend on gradualism? So I only I only I only ask that because I think there are a lot of situations. I think Dan would probably agree with me, where the edifice doesn't fall on. Rise and fall on gradualism. Oh yeah, no, I mean I, I'm not saying my argument rises or falls on gradualism, but you know, it's a reasonable starting point. Yeah. Uh, I found that really interesting and convincing. Um, the one thing that you that was left unstated, it was implicit, was why you think that testing these things in human children is important. And I'm wondering, you know, are there particular ages that you think are you know, do we have to push it back to the earliest point possible in order to um, provide the strongest test? Could you say some things about so, about that? The general motivation of that And what you think that the research on the young kids tells us yeah. with respect to the evolution of language. So it controls for um, other types of intelligence, and particularly physical intelligence, intelligence with the physical world. So um, children of about, Eric will know better than mine, the exact sort of ages, but around two or three years of age, um, Adult chimpanzees and young children have similar powers of, of understanding the physical world, cognitive powers of understanding the physical world, um, but they seem to have very different powers of the social world. So you're, you're controlling for that generally, that, that other type of intelligence when you're comparing the social intelligence. And um, could you say just a little bit more about that? Why, why is that important? Oh, well, because so, so let's say we did this on adults or teenagers or whatever, then somebody could turn around and say, well, they're just generally more intelligent. So it's not the fact that you know there's any particularly uh, social intelligence or particularly metapsychological or communicative intelligence. It's just the general intelligence that's been applied to the particular problem at hand. And you can control for that by um, dealing with um, uh, humans that have similar powers in those in those regards. Um, I don't know. Go on. The shift. The argument you're making for a shift in terms of associative to extensive, mm. which would characterize your argument the great apes and the reversal of it with humans, uh, and particularly the notion this is not a gradual transition, which mm. to be made perfect good sense, that it's not that that's not a gradual transition, yeah. implies that there must be a set of conditions under which that shift is being driven that is unique to humans but is not found in the great apes. Otherwise, presumably, they would make yeah. same transmission in terms of community. Do you have any sort of thoughts on what might be those conditions that would generate that kind of a, of a, so, yeah, like a phase change? I'm generally sympathetic to some version of the social brain hypothesis. So humans are an incredibly social species, live in very large social groups. and um, That seems to have selected for a whole raft of forms of social intelligence. Now, in, 
the social brain hypothesis slash Machiavelli intelligence hypothesis, whatever you want to call it, it's existed in various different forms and people are still arguing over the nuances, but it does seem to me that there's quite a lot of agreement that um, some sort of uh, the hyper-sociality of humans has driven a particularly social intelligence, which gives you the meta-psychology that I've been talking about. Well, certainly the further development of the Machiavellian argument is, is yeah. sort of the, no, to say it's a necessary condition for the argument. Uh, but I don't, I'm curious as to whether one thinks it's a sufficient argument in the sense that one could well argue and say, well, why did we continue in a trajectory towards our present communicative capacities? Why did we plateau at some lower level of communication ability? As well as driving that, that further development of communication abilities right. and not simply reaching a new plateau of some, something a little bit smarter than the great apes, but well, well below modern humans. Yes. So that's, that's why this line here, and I, the real continuity in social intelligence, and one thing I say in the book is that in a way, I mean, this isn't strictly true, but in a way, the way to think about human communication is not as a communication system, but is as a form of social intelligence slash social cognition. I am trying to manipulate your mind right now. You are letting me, and equally, you're trying to read my mind, and we're just helping each other, because we've got this set of tools that allow us to do that in a particularly rich way. So it, it's not the case that there's kind of a simple form of communication that we might have stopped at. I mean, once you get it, you stop there. This, is, this, is, this, whole, this whole communication thing is on the decline of social intelligence, and it's, it's one particular end. But it did stop in the apes. That is, presumably... No, 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 because... The, because oh, oh, sorry, yes, no, I'm right. Sorry, is, because, social intelligence, me. we could easily argue, is also, to whatever extent it was advantageous yeah. for our hominid ancestors, Presumably, it's advantageous for our almost identical chimpanzees ancestors, close to the divergence of the two well, lineages. You, would you buy any version of the Machiavellian intelligence slash social brain hypothesis? No, I, I don't have I don't have any objections with the Machiavellian okay. argument as long as one introduces what would be the conditions under which further development of that Machiavellian intelligence has a payoff, rather than just presuming that somehow it just naturally develops that way. Because once you start down that route, you must follow it all the way to uh, human kinds of communication. It seems to me what's missing in the argument is, what are those external conditions that would be driving that continued development of the Machiavellian intelligence? Because certainly there is, it's not, a, it's hard to imagine it's a self-generating process that couldn't stop yeah. until it got to uh, the level of modern human communication. But if that, that communication is socially beneficial... But what would be the conditions under which it's socially beneficial for hominid ancestry but not for chimpanzee ancestry? So the, yeah, the, that, that question I would reframe as what's the but conditions the under which... But if the, the ability of the individual chimpanzees didn't also evolve, why not? Along with, well, by accident. Yeah, mutations actually have to occur. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, you know, That's you sort of a weak know. argument to say that we, our hominid ancestors just happen to have certain mutations. So the answer in the social brain hypothesis is that humans are more social. We do live in larger groups. We do have you know, a richer array of interactions. Well, Why can't it be a happy accident? As, as we look down at the you know, the development of hominid evolution now is true. As we're coming to the present, yes, we're living in larger groups, but certainly initially we weren't. Mm -hmm. That is, at the time of divergence, you know, our well, hominid ancestors ending up on the Serengeti plain or whatever, the size of the social groups probably is no different than the size of the chimpanzee social groups. Well, right, there are lots of things that differ. So, you know, <laughs> maltreciality in hominids is very, very old and, and predates encephalization. And altruciality is going to favor biparental care. We're the only primate that has extensive biparental care in large groups. So, you know, there, there could be, we could go on all day about things that might have led to um, an upper ceiling that isn't there in apes that was there in hominids. No, no, I don't disagree with that, Dan. In fact, I can give you a long laundry list of things like this. But I just want to bring attention to the fact that in this kind of argument, we also need to be able to identify. Why was it that our particular lineage was driven in this direction, whereas the 
ape lineage was not, is what was different that was going on in our lineage. But that's, the onus isn't on Tom. If, if, if he's saying, uh, oh, I want you to say that, well, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, he's saying, if he's saying you get um, the human communicative abilities once you reach a threshold of social intelligence, um, then the onus is not on him to explain how you reach that threshold. Because as we agree, there are many things that might have been predicted. Well, it may not be, uh, the onus may not be on Tom, which is apparently up to him to decide whether it is or isn't, not for us to decide for him. But it's, the onus is on somebody, or at least to recognize that this is obviously a critical aspect of the argument, is in the sense of rec at least recognizing that there is, needs to be some way of accounting for why did it occur in this lineage but not in others, where the specific kinds of mechanisms one's talking about presumably were also operating the others, that is, social intelligence presumably was also beneficial in the context of chimpanzees. It's already the whole argument about social intelligence development through looking at changes in the primates in terms of social complexity and then the response to that through developing some like social intelligence. Why does that particular trajectory terminate? Whereas ours doesn't. So I'm not saying you have to yeah, answer, well, but yeah. rather it seems to me this is part of the argument that's at some point needs to be addressed. And of course we can all come up with just so stories about what might be the reasons for that. And that then becomes an interesting area of debate as well. Can I take a different question? The yeah. land of the blind, uh, the night man is king. Uh, now this is a, a comment, not a question. Okay. It's about this issue of the ability to attribute communicative intent to an interlocutor's behavior even when you've never seen or yeah. heard that particular behavior before. Yeah. And um, uh, and there is, and I'm sure you know about this, an, ex an experiment out of Tomasello's group that addresses this directly, where the task is to choose the box that has the reward when the, 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 the reward's been hidden in it. The three boxes are visually different from each other. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's two experimenters, one directly facing the subject and the other standing behind the subject who, who communicates something to the subject, either it's a child or an ape either by pointing at the right box, and that, of course, they, both the apes and the children have seen lots of pointing, yeah. or holding up a little replica of the box, yeah. or putting a marker over the box, and those, That's presumably, yeah. the, the child has never seen before, and yet the children are much better at, at picking the correct box, uh, much better than chance, whereas the apes don't do better mm -hmm. than chance. Um, so that's, that. well, the issue that Dan Blumstein was debating with you about, that, that seems like that addresses oh, that. Well, that's it. So the thing with the object choice task is, yeah. So it's clear that the chimps struggle with points in the, in the object choice task. So you can point to one or the other and they still choose a chance level. Um, it's not clear whether that's a failure to recognize that somebody's communicating in the first place or some sort of Actually, although I don't know what the alternative might look like, I'm kind of, I kind of feel like, I feel like there is an alternative that's some sort of killjoy explanation there. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure where my thoughts are going right now. I mean, I don't, it, certainly the, the, the results of the object choice task are consistent with what I'm saying. So, in a way, I'm looking for stronger evidence. Although, but it, I, although it, see, to me, it was very convincing that it seemed to indicate that a child, even a two-year-old child, will, whenever an adult is is doing is looking at or looking at the child, or another way indicating that it yeah. wants the child's attention, no matter what the adult does, even if it's something that the kid has never ever seen before, the, the kid will think, yeah. whatever this is, it's got to be something that's yeah. intended to make me understand something. Yeah. Oh well, uh, yeah. I mean, I certainly think <clears throat> the kids are, are communicating ostensibly, and they're understanding ostensible communication, which is what you're describing. Um, you won't find me arguing. <laughs> I mean, I'm. I'm agreeing that what you're observing there is entirely consistent with what I'm arguing. Um, I guess they're not the direct tests of the four things that I wanted to point, that I'm trying to address, and that's why I haven't talked about them in this talk. But, yeah. I mean, I do get a passing mention in the book, so, yeah. Did you? Well, I know there was another question. Oh. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I'm just wondering, you keep saying you were trying to modify our mental representation and we're trying to modify yours, and I'm just wondering how much of this whole view of things is dependent on this picture of communication, 
that involve, heavily emphasizes mental representation. Yeah. But the words, I missed the beginning of your talk, so maybe you mentioned something about this, but Wittgenstein once said something about how, you know, tools all serve to modify something. So the chisel modifies the, the piece of wood, and, you know, the hammer modifies the nail, and, well, what does the tape measure modify? That modifies my idea of the length of the thing, and, it's, and then Wittgenstein says, what is accomplished by this assimilation of expressions? So I'm just wondering what is done by a, what what is the consequence of viewing everything in terms of mental representations and intentions? And one reason I'm thinking about this is you may well be right that social communication in people that the point of continuity between eight earlier primates and us is social communication. But there have been a lot of patterns found by conversation analysts that don't emphasize um, mental representations. They, they sort of emphasize adjacency pairs, more of a dance, which may involve keeping track of things and maybe involves keeping track of intentions. Um, and I guess, how do you pronounce his name? Federico? Federico? Rosano. Rosano yeah. has found that the... Rosano. Has found <laughs> that, that in, in a lot of primates, there are sort of similar timing and some similar yeah. stuff. So maybe, maybe though this conversation analytic stuff is just the call it conventionalized content that you're kind of saying, sort of setting to the side. Mm. But I'm just wondering, if you focus more on that kind of pattern, do you come up with a slightly different take on things? I don't see the two. Um, I don't. I don't see fo as focusing on the on the conversational patterns and the forms of the conventions and focusing on the mental representations as being in any way opposed. So the the, the former is a consequence of the latter. Right? Wait, which is a consequence? <laughs> <laughs> so. No, what, just just spell it out. Yeah, yeah. We're 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 okay. we're. we're we're engaged in the mental manipulation and mind reading that I was talking about earlier, and and that we, leads to the conversation. And that will lead, and well, I mean, all that and many other things that are that are involved, the cultural attraction and so on and so forth, will lead to conversational patterns that you can observe in conversational analysis and so on and so forth. I don't, I don't, but I don't see any, I don't see any reason. But if the apes have the patterns and they don't have that other stuff, then that doesn't the, work. Well, mm, the patterns are not a. So the patterns that we might observe in ape communication and in human communication are not themselves cognitive traits that can be subject to biological evolution. I mean, they're not. They're patterns of... The ability to produce such sure. patterns. Sure. Well, no, 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 no. No individual produces patterns. These are right. patterns of exchange. The ability so, so. to participate in such patterns. I just wonder if, again, you seem to be saying that the representations are driving everything. And I'm just wondering if it might be the other way around, or if they might both be driving each other, and if it's necessary always to... I, I'm not one of these anti-representational yeah, people, sure. but I wonder if they're always necessary, or even necessarily helpful. And I just think it might be fun to think of it a different way, just for kick. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, 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 I guess there's two points I want to make. Uh, so one, let me draw an, on the conversation analysis and the patterns. Let me draw an analogy with a different area of language mm. which I've worked on, which is um, the fact that we combine things together. You know, ba ba very basics of syntax are sticking things together mm. in various ways. With this human communication, human language is full of this, and some people are starting to uncover simple forms of this in some non-human primate communication. So there's a natural Darwinian story to be told. So last, the last couple of years I've been collaborating with some microbiologists, because I've been sceptical for all the reasons I've been outlining here, but there's actually a continuity there. So I got talking to some microbiologists who work on bacterial communication, um, and we did an experiment re basically replicating the playback experiments done with, um, uh, with various monkey species. We find the same results, so we find combinatorial communication of the same sort we find in monkeys and the bacteria. Now, the point here is that you can see these patterns or these, these surf this is a system, right? So the communication system, like the patterns I was talking about, is not a trait that's subject to biological 
evolution, the capacity to engage in patterns, the capacity to combine things together might be. But there's no reason why that isn't very phylogenetically deep. I don't see them as co cognitively demanding. Bacteria stick signals together. So do monkeys, so do humans. <coughs> That's not the thing to explain. And it seems to me quite plausible the same thing is true of patterns that, we're, that you're pointing to. Well, maybe true. Um, oh, yeah, so, uh, you, you, uh, you started out by talking about what is, you mentioned, alluded to, the, uh, that you might get to uh, what's special or different about human communication. Well, that's a sense of inferential. Sure, yeah. got that. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> the, the, the um, playing further into the, the, taxon, the taxonomizing game, mm. um, people seem to like to talk about what's special for language. Mm. Um, and I was wondering what your position was there, because most of the ingredients that you've given, I mean, surely conventions are not special for language. Um, there's all kinds of cultural conventions that are not linguistic. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, social intelligence is not special for mm. language. Is there anything, in your view, that, uh, or is this an emergent? I'm uh, yeah. thing that hasn't particularly, there's no it's linguistic traits that have specifically been selected. Right, so it seems to me that the, 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 the point number two, the cultural, the, the job with cultural attraction of languages, so is to explain why we see the sorts of properties, the structural properties that we associate with languages. So people have long observed that languages have various interests in structural properties, you know, independent of language relations. Uh, and we need to explain why certain, you know, word orders are common and why other ones are not, okay? Um, and those explanations, well, that's, that's where cultural attraction comes in, and the sorts of factors of attraction that are going to be important are the ability to stick things together, the ability to engage in patterns, pattern you know, interaction, and so on and so forth, and various other things, which may well be phylogenetically deep, may well be shared with other human behaviours, and so on and so forth. Or bacteria, as you can say. Indeed. Um, you know, each one is on a case-by-case -case basis, but I don't, I don't have any one that I want to hold up as, this is only working in language. I don't have any reason to do that. I don't see any... I don't so, know. I mean, but but, but, but that's say? not to say there isn't one. There might sure, be, but I don't sure. know what it is. So I mean, do you? Th so I, I guess what I'm getting at is, um, and and, and I, I confess I don't like when people ask this kind of question. So, <laughs> but I mean, it, what has been selected for? Is there, you know, I mean, if natural selection is selecting for a thing. Mm. Um, is any of it being selected for specifically because of? Oh, I see. Language? So um, maybe, maybe not. So. Um, once you've got ostensive communication and you've got conventions which are making it more expressively powerful, this is an extremely powerful tool, right? It allows us to do all sorts of things. It seems quite plausible to me that you could have the natural selection for mechanisms that make the acquisition of those conventions and the use of those conventions much more fluid and easy than it otherwise might be. If there is such a thing, that's what we should be calling an LAD or a UG or whatever. In fact, I quote your, you say much the same thing in the book. Um, whether there is such a thing of that sort, I actually don't know. Yeah. And that's why I said maybe, maybe not. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I will try to keep this really brief because I'll take up a lot of your time during the rest of okay. your statement. <laughs> but, um, so I think you, you already know that I disagree with you about yeah, the sure. whole, like, yeah. how much do apes do. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to kind of just bang on about that for a second. Okay. So, because I think that the example that you start out with, with the, you know, I'd like a chip, please, mm -hmm. right? None of that would be captured in any of the published literature about apes. And I think that, sure. that you are relying somewhat heavily on, you know, the, like, sort of body of work that manages to get published about primatology and, and mm -hmm. this, you know, meaning of, of primate signals. And I yep. think that, that the onus there is really on primatologists to, to discuss and to really sort of open up our thinking about, about primate communication, but I would say that the, the experiments that are done and certainly the work that's published about sort of repertor communicative repertoires in primates has been heavily influenced by, you know, the kind of, you know, what makes human language special? Oh, yeah, well, let's sure. look at it in yeah, primates and let's look for I code models and let's look for these systems. I, and and I, think, I syntax, agree and I think it's the thing. Yes, yes, <laughs> you know, but yes. I would say that, you know, in certainly the ape gesture literature, 80% of the communication gets thrown out because we just we don't because we don't have enough examples of mm. x leads to y to say anything about it. 
And so the vast majority of interactions and engagements and, you know, subtle, I mean, you know, Abe spent a huge amount of time, this, I'm, I'm borrowing you for a second, you know, doing this. <laughs> Right, and, and, yeah. but none of that is codable. Yeah, sure. And, I and you know, none of that is sort of you know objective and replicable. And you know, there's, there's just the, there's a lot of discussion of like, well, is an anecdote data, and you know, I, I don't really know where I fall. In. I mean, I've yeah. written things about you know the semantics of ape gestures, repertoires. Uh, yeah. You know, so I'm completely guilty of this, but I think that it's that it's very hard to make a claim where you say ape communication is, you know, this way and human communication is this way when this when the the sort of published claims about ape communication being this way mm -hmm. are very strongly influenced by exactly the same kinds of, you know, link sort of faults with linguistics and thinking about what makes human language special Fine. that you're criticized at the first half yeah. of your talk. Fine. So that's why there are question marks on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I would have preferred if you left them as the series of three questions. <laughs> but okay, can, fine. I, can I just really quickly raise my second, like my actual question? That was really <laughs> I wanted to know what you thought um, in terms of the OI model. Yeah. Can you have ostension without a code? Because yeah, sure. A point um, of that, that chip gesture. No, no, I know. I mean, I just mean, could you, can you have, do you think you can have the sort of cognitive capacities as a species without having either a very developed natural or conventional code system? Without meaningful? Yeah, so we, and you can, and you can see it in the natural world, and I think you see it in kids. So ostensive communication precedes linguistic communication and development. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree with you, but I think then, I'm not sure about this ordering of, of communicative intent, of a sense of, sorry, of intentional, wait, informational <laughs> intent and communicative intent as communicative intent follows informative intent. If inform, I mean, if informative intent okay. relies to some extent on there being conventional or natural codes, doesn't it, or was I'm I? Not, no, I'm not following, sorry. Okay, I'll argue about it later. Okay. <laughs> we, I think, are... It's the difference between meaningful and symbolic, right? I've, I've lost track now. Yeah. <laughs> the difference, there. The difference between meaningful and symbolic. Well, that we should take this up after uh, the end of the discussion period because we are now at the end of our discussion. Okay. So, thank you very much.